Where are we? Ow. Where are we? Where are we? What place is this? Where are we? Uh, that's pretty good. We're in the <laughs> a, a time period, a century is good. Oh, I don't want this light on. What uh, place are we in? What is this place? This shrunken place? We got to get the, those, the class management people here. What 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 place is this? What place is this? You, who's looking at me in the black jacket in the second row from the back. Yeah, you. Thank you. OK, yes, we're in Athens. What do we know about Athens? What do we know? What do we know? What do we know? For any of it? We've talked about Athens repeatedly. What do we know about Athens? You in the blue, all the way in the back. That's a nice bright color, easy for me to pick on. What do we know? Get some help. Help him. Help him. Help him, comrades. What should he know? What should he know about Athens? Help him out. What should he know? No. Bandana. All the way in the back. On your head. Yeah. Many types of burials. What else? <laughs> they had quantified class systems by which you mean? What do you mean quantified? That name that you like to say so much. <laughs> Would you be referring to Pentacosio Medimnoi? Yes, I do like to say that. That trips right off my tongue. Um, and that would be which class? Highest. The highest class. And what other classes are there? Cavalry. Cavalry. Cavalry, the knights. And what's the deal with these classes? How do we even know that they exist in this early period? And by early period, I mean which century? I am looking right at you. Ninth and eighth. Very nice. And how do we know that these classes exist in this time period? How do we know? <laughs> because of the sorts of finds in the graves. Yes, like the granary pixis or the horse pixies. And what do these upper classes engage in in addition to lavish burials? What do they engage in? How do they mark themselves? Um, I don't know how they mark themselves, but they make a lot of grain. What, ha what, what, what happens in conjunction with the graves? You all the way back by the window. That would be you. Well, some of the graves have big markers. What, what, what happens in conjunction with the burials? Here's a clue. Large processions with funeral beers. Yes, and what else happens in conjunction with the burials? Funeral. Somebody back there, come on, you people. This is like the fourth time we've gone over this. Thank you. Did you hear that? You knew that? All right. Those funeral games, we know from our friends, ancient vase painters. We love the ancient vase painters who illustrated life so adorably. So here from the 6th century, uh, the vase painter Sophilas, how do we know his name? Because he signed the vase. So proud was he of 
this creation. This was a big, big bowl. It stood on the top of a tall stand. In and of itself, it did not mark a grave. But painted on it is one of the cutest things ever. Are you looking? Look at this. Uh, two teams of horses. You can tell that they are opposing horses because there is one white team and one black team. So the black team of horses and the white team of horses. And you have to assume that sadly missing from this, the, the piece that, that uh, broke off that we don't have would be the chariots behind the horses. And this is uh, marked, this is labeled Patroclus Atla. And actually, and many of you will appreciate this, it's misspelled. Isn't that the cutest thing ever? It is misspelled. I love that. Um, so, yeah, the funeral games of Patroclus. Now, of course, this cannot be the funeral games of Patroclus because this is a scene from current times, which are the sixth, early 6th sixth century BCE. And what's this? What, do you, what, what is this? Yeah, what are these? Yeah, they're spectators. Where are they sitting? Yeah, they're sitting in bleachers. Don't you love this? They're sitting in bleachers. And they're very excited. They're gesticulating and roll and putting out their hands. Go, go, go. They're saying, ah, my guy's not winning. And um, there's a label over here. We have no idea who would have been over on this side, but it says Achilles. That It's also misspelled. Sophilos was very exuberant writer, not so good at the school piece. So, um, so here is a kind of pastiche of the ancient idea and the rendition of it in modern times. It's a sort of like, uh, we're going we're gonna to put on these games. It's, it's almost like a game. We're going to call them the funeral games of Patroclus. But these are funeral games for somebody, who, some wealthy person, who was uh, buried in Athens in the early 6th century. Where did the funeral games take place for these aristocrats who were buried in uh, these fancy elaborate graves? Well, they took place in this area north of the Agora, uh, uh, north of, I'm sorry, north of the Acropolis, down below the Acropolis, um, in this big flat area where, the, where burials have been found, this area that we call the Agora. Now, what century are we in now? We have just catapulted quickly into the 6th, into the 6th century. We've studied two other places and cultural groups from the 6th century so far. You know what these are right away because you have a chart, right? Take that chart out right now. This is your question two chart. This is your, we're developing governments all over the place chart. And on the chart in the 6th century, what happens in Italy? What happens in Italy? The, the, the Romans decide that they no longer want to be ruled by kings. The kings are their own kings. I mean, it's not like they're foreign kings. Um, so there's, there's kings, and the kings have a bunch of aristocrats who would uh, advise them. And, uh, and the Romans collectively decide they no longer want to be ruled by kings. And in the year what, they overthrow the kings and establish a republic. What year? 509. Oh, beautiful. Oh, a beautiful chorus. 509. That was excellent. OK. Um, so that's in Italy. Meanwhile, in the 6th century in the Near East, what happens? What do we know happens over in the Near East? Who gets to be in charge? Cyrus. 
Cyrus, what year? Uh, 538. 538, 539, actually, yeah. And, in, and he marches into Babylon with his hordes of soldiers. Their number is so great, like the waters of a river, they cannot be counted. There are arms by their side, pacifically, peacefully marching into Babylon. Ha, ha, ha. Almost certainly not, but it is a very nice story. And, uh, and takes over. So we have the imperial system of the Persians being established in the Near East throughout the entirety of the Near East in the same century. In the Greek world, in the 6th century, most places, most cities, were ruled by tyrants, T-Y-R-A-N-T-S, the same word as ours. But all that, it, all that the word means for the Greeks in this era is a person who has seized power on their own by force and holds power that way. It doesn't necessarily mean a baddie. It's not necessarily a bad person because who's kind of been in charge to the extent that anybody's been in charge? It's been the people with money and land. It's been the wealthy. It's been the aristocracy. And sometimes they're not so nice to all the other people. So in several cases in uh, Greek cities, these folks that seize power, these individuals that seize power, um, are kind of like populist heroes who look out for the common guy and, and, and seek to protect them from the uh, rapacious, self-regarding aristocracy. So we, we met very briefly uh, one of these tyrants in Ephesus because he built, rebuilt the sanctuary and the temple of Artemis at Ephesus in this colossal, many-columned temple, huge, 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 clearly inspired by the grandiosity of the many-columned halls at Persepolis, but building that temple for the good of the city by enlarging the sanctuary of the patron deity of the city. In Athens in the 6th century, uh, they get a tyrant too, a guy by the name of Pisistratus. He seizes power as a tyrant. He actually seizes power initially in the year 566. Uh, he has a little, he has a few bumps along the way. Gets, he gets roughed up a little, out of power, in power, out of power, in power. Finally, he, he gets a hold of it for good in 546 and rules until he dies in 527. So the bulk of the 6th century down to 527, Pisistratus is in, is in charge. What, uh, what would be a logical thing for Pisistratus to do? A logical thing for Pisistratus to do. You have 30 seconds to chat and come, come up with, you're Pisistratus, you've now seized power, you want everybody to know that you're actually a good sort of guy. Not one of these typical everything for me aristocrats. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? All right, what do you think? Build public buildings, like what? Like what sort of public buildings? A temple. A temple, what a good idea. That's a very good idea. What is the most logical place to build a temple to show that the old, bad, monarchical, aristocratic, palatially based ways are Finally gone. Athens quite socially retarded in this. Every, lots of other people have given up on that a while ago. Yes? On the hill. What's that hill called? That's the Acropolis. Acropolis just means height of the city in Greek. Yes, that is what he does. Good idea. You all get promoted to chief advisor. Yes. Up here on the Acropolis, these foundations here are these foundations here. And they are the foundations of a large temple to Athena, built under the 
regime, the rule, the tyranny of Pisistratus in sometime in the middle of the 6th century BCE. Building one temple is good. Building two temples is even better. And way down here, southeast of the Acropolis, in this open area on the, on, on the backside of the hill, Pisistratus begins an even larger, more magnificent temple, what would have been had it been completed in his lifetime, which it wasn't, the largest temple in the Greek world to the chief cook and bottle washer of the Greek deity pantheon, Zeus. He, the head of everybody on Mount Olympus. So it was a temple to Olympian Zeus, which is called, sorry for the uh, too many vowels, that's Greek for you, Olympian, begun by Pisistratus. It was actually not finished until the Roman era um, in the second century AD. So let's see, 6th, 6th, 5th, 4th, 3rd, 2nd, 1st. So 700 years later, quite the long building project. <laughs> you got to love the classical world. Um, all right. Uh, then, so, built a temple to Athena, the patron deity of the city on the Acropolis. Builds a temple to Olympian Zeus, south of the city. And then... In order to make very clear that the old order of aristocratic behavior will now be tweaked to include more of the people, not only the wealthy people, in the time of Pisistratus, in the year 566, burials in the area of the Agora and, and the Dipolon, north of the city, these burial areas, are um, they're, it's prohibited any longer to use them as burial areas. The games, the aristocratic funeral games, that had been taking place in these regions where these aristocratic funerals had been going on. So you could imagine bleachers being set up in the area of the Acropolis. And instead, this burial area of the Agora was paved over and turned into a public space and in this public space, a new kind of games were established. So games continued. But who put them on? No longer aristocrats, now the state. Who were they for? No longer aristocratic funerals, now for everybody. In fact, they were called the All Athens Games, or in Greek, the Pan Athenaea. And in the year 566, the very first thing he does, the very first year that he manages to seize power, before he loses it briefly, Pisistratus establishes this annual athletic festival called the Pan Athenaea. And the festival included a huge procession all the way up to the new temple that was on the Acropolis, the Athena temple that Pisistratus had built. And the procession went right through the Agora, the area that had been this burial area. And this road that you see here is the ancient festival parade route of the Panathenaic festival, where the participants wended their way and made their way up to the top of the Acropolis. In conjunction with the parade, there were 100 oxen that were sacrificed on the top of the Acropolis. So that really must have been the site. The cult statue of Athena that stood in the temple that Pisistratus had built was given a new robe. Every year a new robe was woven for this ancient wooden cult statue. And the robe was carried 
in the procession up to the Acropolis, and then the statue was adorned. The epic stories of the Trojan War were recited for public consumption, and there were athletic events, games for which there were prizes. And many of the games were the sorts of games that were previously put on by aristocratic families in Athens in conjunction with their funerals, with their burials. How do we know about these? Because the prizes for the games were amphoras, large jars with two handles, amphoras filled with olive oil, which was one of Athens' most important cash crops. The city of Athens, even today, Attica is filled with olive trees and olive oil, which was just as highly sought after in antiquity as it is today, and was even more useful because in addition to using it for cooking, you also used it to slather all over your body when you exercised and then you scraped it off. And uh, you also used it to light lamps. It was fuel for lamps. So it was very, very important household um, item in all sorts of ways. And the olive oil was given in jars that were specially decorated for the games. And on the one side of every jar, was a depiction of the event in which you won your prize. So this is the foot race. Somebody won the foot race, and they got this amphora. This is, uh, now I can't remember if it's, what is this? This must be wrestling. Because if it would be boxing, they'd have something on their <coughs> fists, right? So this must be wrestling. One, so this guy's down, down for the count. Or maybe that makes it boxing. I don't know. Anyway, it's some hand-to-hand -hand combat-like thing. And this is um, uh, the armed, the, the soldiers' race. So there was a race in which um, people wore their armor and carried their shields. People, men, uh, wore their armor and carried their shields and, and, and ran. So I c you can tell that this guy must be the winner. He's very excited. He's saying, hi, it's me. I won. So, so uh, we have... Um, Panathenaic amphoras showing all of the different um, athletic games, contests, in which people competed in the Panathenaic games. And on the other side of every single one of the amphoras is a depiction of the patron deity of Athens, the goddess Athena, with her shield and her helmet. And the amphoras are, are almost always labeled from the games in Athens is what they say on the side in, in Greek. So these games transformed prestige, at least partially transformed prestige in Athens. Before, the only way that you could have power and prestige was if you were born into it, if you had money or you were, you were born into a, a wealthy family. Now, if you have athletic prowess, you too can become somebody important, somebody of note. It's another route to public approbation. This should sound a little familiar. And the route of the Pan-Athenaic procession moved through the city from its entrance at the Dipolon Gate, through the area of the Agora, and then up to the Acropolis, where the temple of Athena that Pisistratus built uh, was, and then all of the oxen were sacrificed. And in this way, in one fell swoop, these zones that had been aristocratic turf, aristocratic territory, were transformed into public zones for the people of Athens. So public amenities was one key way that 
Pisistratus served the people of Athens with, um, uh, with the Panathenaic Games, and he, and he built a fountain house down here in the Agora, right around the area of this cute little Byzantine period church. Um, and public piety was another way in which he served the people of Athens with his temple on the Acropolis, the Athena Temple, and the Olympieion, which is about there <laughs> in this view on the backside of the Acropolis. And in the Agora itself, he, um, he also built a little altar and you see here one, one corner of the altar as it was excavated um, by archaeologists in the 1930s. Uh, and uh, here's a reconstruction of it. An altar in a small enclosure, and here is the, is the altar, to the 12 gods. And it was a place of refuge. If you were inside this small, um, this small space, this small walled off space, uh, then d you were untouchable, nobody could harm you. And it was established as the base point for the city of Athens. So all distances to and from the city were measured. If they'd had map quest in the 6th century in Athens, this would be the zero point for the city. Um, what am I doing next? Ah, OK. <laughs> uh, now, here's the area of the Agora that had been this burial place and now has this great street going through it, the street of the Panathenaea. Here's the fountain house that Pisistratus built and the altar of the 12 gods. And you see that both of them, one marks um, the one edge of the street as it goes up to the Acropolis. The, the Acropolis is actually in this direction. And uh, one marks the entry uh, into the Agora the, of the Panathenaic street. And here, over here in one corner of the Agora, is this large, um, is this large building complex. And <laughs> this large building complex is called, very elegantly, by the excavators of the Agora, buildings C, D, and F. So this is building F. <laughs> and as you can see, it's a pretty sizable building in quite the swell location. Very, very nice location, right on the edge of the Agora, um, with a nice little feature inside, a large open courtyard with, what are these dots? Columns. columns right. So a big, uh, big open courtyard with columns decorating the interior, large gathering space, prominent location, super size. Uh, so what might you assume this was? Some sort of a palace. What, what would be another idea? What else might you assume this was? Thinking about the location and some bit pro pro possibly something administrative. Uh-oh, I just unplugged somebody. There you go, sweet. Uh, and what would you want to know in order to choose between those things? What would you want to know about um, fr what could archaeology tell you that might help you decide what this was? What would you want to know? Um, if there were any like, living artifacts, like cooking pots or stuff like that, to indicate that someone actually lived there and not just had administrative offices. Perfect. That's what you would want to know. You would want to know what was found inside. So now I will tell you that what was found inside were typical household objects and nothing more. Cooking pots, spindle whirls, loom weights, dishes, pots and pans, household goods. And so what do you decide this is? A house. A house. A house, a particularly nice house, a particularly elaborate house, but nonetheless a house in a very, very swell location. Many archaeologists, me included, think that it is likely that this was the house of Pisistratus himself. So we wouldn't exactly call it a palace then, because he's not a king. 
And it doesn't include all of the other functions that we think of in a palace. If you think about a megaron, for example, a mycenae megaron is a palace, you have a lot of other things that are going on in there. That's not the case here. So this is not even, for example, like Nicoria's Unit 4.1 that was multipurpose, including uh, with some sacred space inside. This is really just a particularly elaborate private house. All right. Um, Pisistratus dies in the year 527. He has two sons. Um, his sons are named Hipparchus and Hippias, uh, which are two names that mean, um, Hipparchus means leader of horses, because Hippos is horse in Greek, and Hippias means, I don't know, horsey, <laughs> like really into horses or something like that. Um, and, and those are very um, aristocratic names, horses being one of the markers of uh, uh, one of the upper classes in Athens for, for all these many years now. All right, um, Hipparchus and Hippias are not nearly as um, popular with the people of Athens as their dad, Pisistratus, had been. And in the year 514, these two fellows, um, who you see here in um, heroic Roman copies of um, ancient sculptures, these two fellows, um, who also have names, Harmodius and Aristogiton, but don't, don't write that down, you don't need to know their names. These two fellows uh, murdered Hipparchus. Now, um, there was a lot of ancient scuttlebutt about just exactly what was going on. Was it a love triangle? Was somebody jealous? It's not, it was not necessarily so, um, such a democratically revolutionary wonderful act. But in any event, Hipparchus is killed in 514. Hippias is run out of town in the year 510. These two guys are sort of heroized as tyrant slayers, and so heroized are they that um, even on uh, later Panathenaic amphora, this is a Panathenaic amphora um, from about 100 years later. Here's Athena, um, the columns from the games in Athens, and a shield. And on her shield is a depiction of the two tyrant slayers, Harmodius and Aristogiton. Um, so, so we know, and we know from ancient sources that there was a statue of Harmodius and Aristogiton, uh, the tyrant slayers, in the Agora. What were the, what was the statue in the Forum in Rome? What was the statue in the Forum in Rome? What was the statue in the Forum in Rome? Yes, actually, it's just the wolf without Romulus and Remus. Yes, the Capitoline wolf um, was the statue in Rome. It's very interesting, you know, what people decide to represent themselves by and honor and memorialize. It's very interesting. So um, in Persepolis, all the great sculptures of the king and in Rome, it's the Capitoline Wolf. And, uh, and in Athens, it was the Tyrant Slayers. That, that was the, stat the, the pair of statues that was in the Agora. All right. So in, so in uh, 510, Hippias is run out, of, run out of Athens. You know where he goes? Actually, we're going to meet up with him um, very, very briefly at the beginning of next hour. He goes to Persia. He goes to Persepolis where he's quite welcomed and made to feel like very important. Um, all right, meanwhile, back in Athens, the Athene, the, the people, the, the various um, the representatives of, of various old line Athenian families construct a completely new system to govern themselves. In this new system, all of the towns, the 140 towns of Attica, this is Attica, 
A-T-T-I-C-A. Attica is the zone, the region of Greece in which Athens sits. All 140 towns in Attica are assigned to one of 10 new tribal units, 10 sort of overarching tribal groups are created. And every one of these tribal groups receives members, townships, from all three of the zones of Attica. So zone one is the city of Athens itself, so sort of greater metropolitan Athens. And there are tons of little, little townlets in and around greater metropolitan Athens. And every one of the, the new 10 tribes um, receives some villagers from the city itself, Athens, also from the mountainous interior of Attica, and also the coast, the perimeter. So towns from the city, the mountainous interior, and the coast are, are assigned altogether to uh, one of 10 tribes. That means that every one of the 10 tribes has members from all sections of Attica. There is not a tribe that just represents the city and a tribe that just represents one area of the coast. So, so people are mixed and matched. <laughs> this, this, this diagram that I, this very simple diagram that I have up here is what I have uh, now decided to use to explain this as opposed to this, which is the explanation chart that, you, that accompanies um, most descriptions of how this new, this new governmental system is organized. I know this is a little, a little overly complicated. In any event, this new kind of government, which is invented in Athens in the year 510, isn't that an amazing coincidence? That's an amazing coincidence, because what else happens right around this time, 510, 509? Rome, yeah, um, is called rule by the people. The Greek word for rule is, is archos, and the Greek word for people is demos, and the type of government is democracy. The de new democratic government that is constituted in Athens in um, Five, from 510 to 508, is uh, faced with the charge of coming up with some office space where people, representatives of this new government, can meet. And the first order of business is to come up with uh, an assembly or council house. Every one of the 10 tribes every year in the new government is required to send 50 members to serve on the council of Athens, Athens slash Attica, um, for a year. So there are 10 tribes, if 50 people come, that's 500 people. 500 people who serve for one year, that means every day they go to uh, meet together. So you need a building for that sort of thing. And the building is constructed right down in this area of the southeastern corner of the Agora. In fact, a whole suite of buildings. And this is the plan that you guys have. Your, the handout that you have is, is this. And so just north of building F is this new um, council house established. Ooh, I forgot I was going to talk about this first. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. As soon as I explain to you that one of the very first things that the new government does is decide that from now on, this area, the Agora, is no longer anybody's private property. It's the property of the city and the people. And in order to make that very clear, there are boundary stones 
that are erected at all of the edges of the open square of the Agra. And here's one of those boundary stones. And just in case you are not sure what this little stone is, they tell you what they are because they are labeled. They say, um, I am the boundary of the Agora. Horos, Horos is the boundary. Horos, Amy, Tis Agoras. I am the boundary of the Agora. So uh, inside here, you can't have a house, you can't own property, you can't bury anybody. This, this is public ground. Uh, and then, like I said, just north of Building F, where there had been, um, who knows what, these, these two other little structures that no, nobody knows exactly what they are, this new council house, uh, council in Greek is a boule, B-O-U-L-E, the same word, I think, that's like a round loaf of bread. <laughs> and, uh, the, and the building that they, that they use is a bouletirion, a, a council building. And here you see a reconstruction. Uh, drawing of the interior of the Bulutirion in the Agora of the council house. And you will be very happy to know that um, archaeologists have determined that if you measure the amount of sitting space that each person needs, and it's about two-thirds of um, a meter, that this building would seat reasonably comfortably, but pretty closely, 500 people. So... Perfect, perfectly sized. And as you can see, it's set up similar to the commission in the Roman Forum where uh, there are um, there's seating, raised banks of seats on all sides, with the difference being that the commission um, was completely circular and this has seats on three sides and then a space in the front for a speaker. These, w these are the entrances into the building right there. All right, ooh. <laughs> uh, up here at the northern edge of the Agora, just opposite the altar of the 12 gods, which had been built by Pisistratus, another structure was discovered by um, uh, archaeologists working here, a structure that is for one of the new officials that has been... Um, put into place in the new democratic constitution. This new official is called the Royal Archon, A-R-C-H-O-N. And his structure, his sort of office, is called the Royal Stoa. A Stoa is just a name for a type of building where you have a kind of hall with columns down the middle, and it's open on one side. It, it's a little bit like a modified strip mall sort of idea, it, except that there's not individual shops inside. So here you see the footprint of the Royal Stoa as it was excavated, and here a reconstruction, or a plan, and here a reconstruction. Now, take a minute with somebody sitting near you and come up with as many important features as you can think of about this building. Go. I don't know how well you can see it from back here, but this is a person. So this gives you a sense of scale. That's important. Okay, I'm going to call on your row. We're just going to go right down your row, okay? All right. Things that, are, things that you note that are going to help us 
totally understand and appreciate this building, what's one thing? Because what are you looking at? It's got columns. It's got columns, and we associate columns with temples and important structures. What else? It, there are fewer columns on the inside than, than the outside. Well, yes, that's, that's true. They would have been higher. Um, right, okay. Next. Lovely. It is extremely open because what is the feature of the plan that makes you say that? What is the feature of the plan that makes you say that? So where's the entrance? And what's the front? The entire side. So what, what's the shape of the building? It's a rectangle with the entrance on the long side. It's a rectangle with the entrance on the long side. So it has this very open effect. Next, what, what's something else about this building? It's very large. It's not actually super large. Um, I'll tell you exactly how big it is. I wrote this down. It is 18, it's, it's large, but it's 18 meters long by seven and a half meters wide. Do you note this person standing here giving you a sense of scale? What can you tell me about the scale? What do you see? What do you notice? What would that tell you? <laughs> what about the scale? Last time we looked at two buildings with lots and lots of columns. One was at Ephesus, the new temple of Artemis. One was in Persepolis, the Abdana. How tall are the columns in the Abdana? That's right. Yeah, nothing like this. How high? 70 feet, the columns. So this is a drawing to scale, and this person is put in this drawing on purpose. And what is the scale of this building. Not huge. It's human scale. It's our scale. If Persepolis and the structures there or the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus were designed to dazzle, this is deliberately designed to welcome. It's your size, not some cosmic size. What about the material that this is built in? What material is this built in? Stone, all the way up to the top, with uh, columns that are in a classical order and a frieze of um, Triglyphs and metopes across the top, just like a temple. That's why it reminds you of a temple. It carries all the markers of impressive sacred architecture put to the use of a brand new governmental office and a brand new government. And the consequence is what? You slog into the Agora from your little town in rural Attica out in the hills, and you come into the city and see this. What do you think 
about this new office? What do you think? It, uh, it's for me. It is. It's accessible. Mm -hmm. It's. It's made for people and not for the gods. But what about the material? What about the columns? What about the style? Well, it's you know, made out of stone and it's nicely crafted or nicely built. But yeah, like, it's, it's very high quality, but it's still for the people. So like, the people are capable of making something you know, this nice, but it's still for them. But you don't have to say. But you can say and, as in, it is for the people and it is just as nice, just as well built, just as adorned with columns and a frieze as a temple. Because a building for the office of this government, which is a human creation, here and now, is just as important as a building for the gods up on the Acropolis. Why do banks so often adopt this kind of architecture? What's the message? Stability. What else? So you have two choices where you can put your money. One is uh, a sort of little Quonset hut. And another is something that looks like Northrop, Northrop Auditorium. Which do you trust? It, well, it, it, it represents trust. You can trust this. This is, not, this is stable. This is not going anywhere. The setup of the royal stoa is magnified by its location. It is placed in close proximity to, just across the road from, the altar of the 12 gods. What's usually in front of a temple? Altars. Altars are almost always in front of temples. In fact, altars are the main event. The temple is just uh, background. All of the business takes place on the altar. And up here in the corner of this newly established public space, the Agora in Athens, right across from the altar that, that the late tyrant Pisistratus had built, a new kind of building, temple-like but not a temple, for a new kind of government is erected by the Athenians in the Agora. Well, um, there is uh, a lot of stuff besides legal business. I mean, um, council business, government, that takes place in the Agora. Here are some of the finds from the Agora that allow us to know what else went on in this space. There were markets all the time in the Agora. Every single day, people came to buy and sell goods. And the state, the new Athenian state, was interested in everybody getting a fair shake. And in order for that to happen, everybody who um, sold goods in the Agora had to abide by a consistent set of measures. And in order for that to happen, the state, the government, produced measures for liquid goods and dry goods that everybody had to use, and we have some of them. So this amphora is a liquid measure, and it is labeled demosion, that is public, demos, of the people. And it has the symbol of Athens, which is an owl, because Athena's little guardian 
bird figure is an owl. And so the, one of the symbols of Athens is an owl. And uh, here are two dry measures. If anybody here um, does any cooking or baking, you all know what the point is of a dry measure. A dry measure is like a one cup measure. Why does a one cup measure, what's the difference between a dry measure and a liquid measure? Wh why would a dry measure look like this? Do you know? Is it, hmm? So you can level it off. Very good. That's right. So for all of you bread makers in the audience and, and cake makers and everything else, this is, don't you know this? You put, your, you put your one cup measure in the bag of flour and then you want to be able to level it off. You can't, you know, just heap it up and that's what these are. So they have very specific reinforced level tops so that you can measure um, beans or figs or grain or whatever and again, they're labeled uh, as, as public measure. You might not be able to make it out there. This is bronze, and the labeling is punched in. De mos o s, right there. Uh, there were law courts in the Agora. This structure right down here uh, is a law court, the Heliaia. And uh, where you have law courts, you have lawyers. And where you have lawyers, you have a lot of talk. And where you have a lot of talk, you kind of want to know how to curtail that. And the Athenians came up with something that would ensure that your lawyer and your lawyer would each get the same amount of time to make their case. And that device was a water clock. And here is how it worked. Here's the, the pot, and you see that it's got a spigot right down here at the bottom. A water clock, clepsydra. And a second pot was put below, and when it was your lawyer's turn to speak, the clepsydra, main clepsydra, was, was filled with water, and then the spigot was opened. This happens to be a six-minute water clock, this one. There are different sizes for different lengths of speeches. And we have preserved from Athens speeches that lawyers um, have given, uh, ancient, ancient um, defenses, and, they'll, and sometimes they'll say things like, the, the amount, uh, the, the additional number of things that I could say that um, would, would prove this man guilty are, are too long for the amount of time I can see I have left to me from the arc of the water in the clepsydra as it is draining lower and lower, so I will have to stop now, blah, blah, blah. Um, so uh, lawyers would be able to tell from the strength and the arc of the water as it, as it came through how much time they, they had. Uh, if you have law, you have trials. And if you have trials, you have juries. And if you have juries, you need to vote. This is a ballot box. It's actually the ends of two pipes that were turned on end um, and used to make a ballot box. And ballots were actually found inside. And there are two kinds of ballots. Kinds with solid stems and kinds with hollow stems. As a member of the jury, when you would enter the courtroom, you were given two ballots. And the stems are such that, as you can see, you could put your fingers around the stems. And so nobody could see which ballot in particular you had in your right hand or your left hand. And you would listen to the lawyers, and they would make their speeches, and then you would decide, and you would walk out, and as you walked out, you would drop a ballot in the ballot box. If you thought the story was solid, you would drop a solid ballot in, but if you thought the story had a few holes in it, you would drop one of these in, and then the ballots could be counted up. ballot box. You know, when a, yes, sir? How do you know which ballot How do we know? Yeah. We know because we have um, plays and speeches from Athens, and they refer to ballots and tell and make comments about things like this. So the, whole, the comment about his story was full of holes, I put 
you know, the, the hollow stemmed ballot in our, our comments. And then finding the actual ones that correlate with that tell us that that's not just a, f a manner of speaking, but actually relates, relates to something specific. I have to say that um, I just can't stand the idea of touchscreen voting. I think in 2,000 years, people are going to think we stopped being we stopped being a real democracy in this country. If all they have is the archaeology, you know, they'll find all these voting machines and ballots and all the paraphernalia that shows the creakiness and immediacy and individual human interaction with government, and then it's all going to disappear. They're not going to have any of it anymore. I just think that's terrible. Terrible. I hope that doesn't happen. Yes? You think in 2,000 years any of these computers are going to be working and anybody's going to be able to read any of this stuff? No, but the data will be there. Oh, maybe. I don't know. I'd go for a clay tablet. The information is always going to be there. Oh, brother, you've got to study some archaeology, the amount of information that goes missing. Oh, man. All right. This, this is the coolest artifact from the Agora. Are you ready? This is how you pick a jury. This is a jury picking machine. It's called a Claritarion. This is just one fragment. These are some of the objects that go with it. They are little bronze, I'm going to explain this to you. They are little bronze kind of tickets. Every citizen of Athens had one of these issued. It's like a dog tag. It has your name, your father's name, not you because you're not a citizen because you're female, but all you guys. Uh, your name, your father's name, and your deem, your township, where you came from. And the other item that you need for the jury picking machine are little balls. They look like marbles. There are black ones and there are white ones. All right. Here's how it worked. First of all, there were trials going on all the time in the Agora. And the key thing with the trial is that the jury has to be not rigged. It has to be completely unbiased. And in order to ensure that, you want a pretty large jury, and you want to pick the members of the jury at the last minute. So you don't know whether you're going to be uh, picked in the jury. All right. So if you're in the Agora and there's going to be a trial, all citizens were required to then go over to the area where there was going to be a trial, and take their, their little dog tag and drop it in, uh, there were the, the jury machines and there were baskets in front of the uh, jury picking machines. You see that there are one, two, three, four, five, ten columns. Each column is for a tribe. You would put your dog tag in the basket in front of whichever column corresponds with your tribe. When it's time to pick the jury, uh, somebody would take the basket with the, all the tribal dog tags and stick the tags one after another in slots down the rows. Then somebody would take these black and white balls, these little marble balls, and drop them down uh, the shaft. And then at the bottom, a little crank was pulled and a ball would come out. So you couldn't tell whether it was going to be a black ball or a white ball. If it was a white ball, that ball controlled the top row of dog tags. So if it was a white ball, everybody in the top row, one person from each of those 10 tribes, would be selected and they would have to go in for jury duty. If it was a black ball, they would all be sent away. They could go do their shopping or whatever. And then the crank would be turned again and the next row, and so on and so forth, white or black, would each turn of the crank would select 10 jurors, one from every tribe. But it was very random. You wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to know. And then, then and there, the jury would be selected and everybody would go in to, um, to hear the lawyers talk and to cast their ballots and, and make their case. So this is the Agora. And it is the government center and more of 
the city of Athens. What are all the things that we know from the buildings and the finds that went on in the Agora? What are all the things we know? Yeah, what happened there? What happened there? What's something that went on in the Agora? Trials went on in the Agora. What's something else that went on in the Agora? Shopping went on in the Agora. What's something else that went on in the Agora? What goes on in the Bulletarian? Person behind you. Help her. Turn, turn around. Tell, tell that guy right behind you to help you. What goes on in the Bulletarian? What goes on in the Bulletarian? It is. So what goes on there? What else? What goes on in the council house? What are those folks doing all year long? 50 tribal members from each, 50 members from each tribe, 500 people all together. Legislating. Legislating. What else goes on in the Agora? The Panathenaic procession goes through the Agora. <laughs> so this is a space for commerce and legal business, voting, trials, and, and jury selection, and legislating. It is, and celebrating. It's like the National Mall in Washington, D.C. It has some of everything. A new kind of space created in a city for a society that very, very slowly came to a sense of a group idea larger than the sum of its parts. One last thing, just in case, I hate to leave people thinking, there's never, ever been a society as perfect and wonderful as Athens in the later 6th and the 5th century. So there was, there's one other um, institution that was developed in the new democratic government. Let's say that the people in general decide that there is one person who is just deleterious to the social fabric of the larger community. Somebody who is so much trouble, is so negative, is, is, is so problematic that that person, it would be good if that person could be gotten rid of. Well, there was a way to do that in ancient Athens. And the process was called ostracism, O-S-T-R-A-C. I-S-M, O-S-T-R-A-C-I-S-M, ostracism. Here's how it worked. Every year, there was a day on which all citizens came to the Agora simply to vote on whether there should be an ostracism that year. And if 6,000 people voted yes, then a date was set about a month or so later, and people could come, and there was no minimum number of people that needed to come, and bring with them a vote, one vote, one person, one vote, on who should be ostracized. Now, what did people write on to carry, the, carry with them? Well, they wrote on the most common sort of debris that was found in antiquity and is found today in archaeological sites, and that is broken pieces of pottery. And on broken pieces of pottery, people would write the names of 
people that they thought should be ostracized. Chimon, the son of Miltiades. Um, uh, Aristides, the son of uh, Lysimachus. Themistocles, who was a pretty famous ancient Athenian um, official. And people would come into the Agora with their ostraka, O-S-T-R-A-K-A, and ostrakon, O-S-T-R, A-K-O-N, is a single fragment of pottery on which one of these names is written. And there have been several thousand found um, in the Agora and also in the area of the Dipolon by archaeologists. Uh, and, and then whoever received the majority of votes would be exiled from the city, I mean actually forced to leave the city for a year. A whole year. Wouldn't it be good? I think it would be kind of good if we had this. I, can, I have a whole list of public people that I would readily, readily make a little trip to Washington with an ostracon to see if I could just kick out for a year. Just imagine. What a great thing. All right. So, um, so what this required, of course, in addition to your participation as a citizen, was um, some thought beforehand, the ability to write, and um, the simple act of going to the trouble of picking up a broken piece of pottery at some point before the vote and writing the name of the person you want to uh, kick out. But what if, what if you just end up going to the Agora that day for um, a show? I mean, just to see what happens. You don't necessarily have anything in your hand. In the southeast corner of the Agora, archaeologists found a cache of, these are just some, of 190 ostraca, all with the same person's name on it, that had been written by 14 people. And the name is Themistocles. He had some powerful enemies. So you could enter the Agora on that day, and maybe you didn't have an ostracon, or maybe you didn't really feel all committed to the person whose name you had written down, and there would be somebody there saying, would you like to have an ostracon? <laughs> Here you go. And maybe you couldn't even read, and you wouldn't even know. And in this, in this way, um, the system, well, uh, you could fool with it, which is, I guess, I guess that's actually a good lesson to know that um, even something that can sound as beautiful on paper as the new democracy of Athens, in practice, thanks to archaeology, didn't necessarily always work out like that. See you Thursday. <laughs>